chat show today. We're filming in the community of Delft, and today we're talking about poverty and how it affects the community in various ways and how we can help to alleviate that problem. With me, as always, Felicity Guest, my co-host, my activist, my informant um, of Pandora's Box. Welcome again, Felicity, and thank you for joining me. Thank you, Leila. It's great being here. It's wonderful being in the community for a it change. It is, isn't it? Mm. So we came all the way out of our studio and our home, and we are here with the community today. And it's wonderful to have some of the community members here with us. So thank you also for joining us today. It's lovely having you. So today we're talking about poverty and impoverished communities. And the issues that we have dealt with up until now probably affect these communities more so than anybody else. And when we look at maintenance, um, especially single moms, it's probably more prevalent in these communities than anywhere else. I think it is um, because there is a lack of resources and knowledge on how to go about the process and the myths attached to that it's dysfunctional and not worth doing. Um, and also some of the social stigmas around um, we're battling. And this is the impact that it's having on us. So when you look at stats and single moms, um, what are we looking at in terms of absent fathers? How, how high are the stats? 52% um, of children in this country are growing up in single-headed households. And most of them are doing it without a financial contribution from the other parent. So it's very, very prevalent. And um, the impact is felt a lot greater because um, as I said earlier, you know, it's just a lack of knowledge and how to go about enforcing those rights because there's a lack of education about one's rights and what they mean and how you can go about enforcing them. Because as we've said before, we have this incredible Bill of Rights mm. and unless you really understand what it means, um, it, it doesn't have the value that it's intended to, to protect the citizens of this country um, particularly the marginalised communities who, who don't have access. So I think that our government has a big responsibility in taking this information into the communities, and it's not just around maintenance issues, it's about service delivery across the spectrum. You mentioned service delivery, in an area where, where people are struggling to make ends meet, where the government are clearly not doing enough, um, People have a lot of complaints. I've spoken to some of the locals and they have a list of demands and complaints and concerns, not just with regards to service delivery, but when we look at the children, you know, drugs, how that affects them, how gangsterism affects them in these communities. Um, currently, when we look at our system, and we've spoken about this in terms of the maintenance, the system is like three and a half years behind, I think you mentioned. Um, how, how are we looking at the solution? What possible solution um, is there for these communities? I think it's very important to acknowledge that the communities themselves play probably the most critical role in demanding um, that the, the government fulfills its mandate and that is to serve the people. So it's them galvanizing and demanding that the representatives come into the communities and actually hear what the concerns are and have a strategy to remedy and to um, follow through on it. You know, often during election times, which we've just been through, mm. you know, these politicians come and they promise the world. And when it comes to delivery, they just don't deliver. But come next year when it's election, or four years time when it's election, they're back knocking on the door. And we really have to hold them accountable. Mm. And we have to be persistent about it. Um, not in a destructive way, but, you know, they're accountable to us. So when we look at, I mean, the, the amount of problems that we are facing as women are probably tantamount in these communities. As we said, you know, if you look at a lot of people are back dwellers, they're living four or five families on one um, premise, they have very little income, there's often one person um, fulfilling the role uh, of bringing money into the home and keeping four to five families afloat. The problem with a lot of these, commu uh, these communities in South Africa, the money is made outside of the community and it's also spent outside of the community, so very often the community remain impoverished. 
what kind of solutions can we, as women, because that's all what Pandora's Box is all about, is bringing solutions rather than um, relying on the government. How can we take Pandora's Box, in your opinion, and bring information that will bring solutions to women in particular? I think it starts, in the, as I said, in the community and have these dialogues and let them bring suggestions to the party um, about ways to create social enterprises, mm -hmm. little hubs, so that they can earn the money here and keep the money here. And it will save them from having to leave the area in pursuit of jobs. Well, we have in our audience, we have quite a few ladies. We also have a grandmother here with her grandchild. And I'm going to ask them, because, you know, I'm always very aware of the fact that I don't live in this community. I have for a very long time lived in various communities um, outside of my racial group. So I do understand a little bit about what people are going through. However, saying that, I'm always very aware of the fact that if I'm not in the community, I might not exactly understand what they are going through. And I think it's very important for me. And part of a lot of the, the projects that I engage in is about getting to know people on the ground and let them tell us what they're dealing with. Let them tell us what the struggles are, because the struggles are real, but it's completely different to our maintenance issue. It's completely different to the maintenance issue of somebody living in Delft. And the bottom line is, yes, we all need money. Yes, we need to survive. But the depth of it differ completely. We still have a career. We still have some form of income. Many of these women have nothing. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Welcome back. We are talking about poverty and we are filming in the community of Delft today where we have a wonderful audience members who is talking all about the problems that they're encountering in this community. And I am a big believer of coming to the people, find out what the problem is and then together we can create solutions. With us today, we have Bulilani Ngaku. He is from the Eastern Cape. He grew up um, in Joe Slovo. When he was two years old, he came down to Cape Town with his parents. He grew up in Joe Slovo until the age of nine, and due to abuse in his family, he decided to take to the streets. Bulilani, thank you so much for coming with us and thank you, thank uh, you. sharing your story with us today. Thank you, Leila, and thanks to the audience. Thank you. Okay, so you grew up in Joe Slovo until nine years old. Tell us what that was like. Like any other child that grows up in a township, um, seven, eight, I remember. I, play, I used to play with other kids. I spent time, I was in uh, primary school, just like the other kids. But obviously, uh, the community is poverty stricken. Mm. Yes. And so, I think poverty is the major problem that actually brought about the abuse that came into my household because people were frustrated, the fact that they can't uh, raise me properly or they can't really afford any uh, uh, important stuff such as food, clothing, and so forth. And uh, my mother was unemployed at the time, so yeah, I think that's where the frustration stemmed from. And so what are the, the kind of issues that you guys were dealing with in terms of poverty? Um, even though it's a, uh, it's a poverty-stricken community, but obviously you know, there is competition. If you're not mm -hmm. providing for your children, then you're seen as as an uh, irresponsible parent. Mm. And so I think, I think that's where the frustration, my mother's frustration came from. So she was competing um, amongst people that were working in restaurants, washing dishes, and she didn't have a job, mm. you know, and yeah. Where was your dad in 
all of this while you were growing up? Um, my father was always absent in the house. I've never seen, I've, I don't remember his face either. So there was no connection with my dad, with my family and my dad or whatsoever. He was, never, he was nowhere to be found. And your mum's family, did they perhaps encourage her to get your father to assist? They had problems of their own, I guess. So they expected my mother, because they also had kids of their own that they were supporting, and they were strugg also struggling to get jobs. So they expected my mother to, to take care of me and to just take care, uh, to be responsible as a mother. So in, in the community that you were growing up, was it predominantly moms and children? It was pretty, uh, there were men, but it was predominantly women. It's interesting how that is still prevalent in today's communities where it is assumed and expected the woman must take responsibility, the woman must make sure everything is sorted out, and the men kind of are off the hook. And I think in, in particularly for that reason is why we're doing Pandora's Box and why the focus is on women so strongly. It's not that we bash men, it's not that we think men are not worthy and, and they don't have problems, it is that it is expected of women to do certain things. And we are always left with that responsibility, no matter what. So Bulalani, when, when you grew up, up until the age of nine, there was so much abuse. What kind of abuse did you encounter in your home? Um, like my mother then took up drinking because then she was unemployed and she mixed up with the crew that was also unemployed. And what they did is, uh, if they had anything, uh, any, some, any money that they made, they would sit and drink at the Shibin until like the late hours and then go home. And then when she gets home, she would find something that was wrong or, you know, and then, cause, but then now that I'm older, I get to understand that it was all frustrations of being unemployed and hanging out with people that she didn't want to hang out with. But due to the situation, cause they were all facing the same situation, so. Yeah. So you left home because of the drinking or the physical abuse? It's uh, the physical abuse. Physical abuse. Yeah. And then you, you left and at nine years old, I can't even imagine, I mean my kids, the youngest one is 13 and I can't even imagine my 13 year old being left on his own and in the streets with no adult supervision. How did you go from, from a home environment to the streets and how did you cope? Um, well, because um, my mother once came into the house and then she beat me up to the point where I, was, I laid in at the Red Cross Children's Hospital. But then, yeah, the social workers asked me to uh, put up a, ca a case against her and maybe c get her arrested and so forth. But I, I refused and then hoping that maybe things would get better because now that I didn't open up the case and I told her about it, I thought things would get better. But when I went back home, things went even worse and then she would beat me up and ask me to go get the social workers that were trying to get her into the prison. Then I realized, you know, this is not it. And then I took off. I first uh, started hanging out in Milneton, uh, in the Milneton area. And then, but it, it, um, the things were getting, Street people in Milton, uh, they started wanting to abuse me, they were chasing me down the street. So I thought, you know, maybe there is a better place out there, and then I ended up in town. Where you're still uh, living now today? Yes. And so you went from living on the streets to living in a shelter. Can you talk to us about that? <laughs> it, was a, it was a difficult transition, because living on the street for a very long time, and then, you know, suddenly being approached by uh, people that, uh, field workers, refer to them as field workers, to go into the shelter countless times. Um, and my fellow street people told me that, you know, shelters are more like prisons. So it's an, you're gonna get institu uh, institutionalized when you get in there, and then, you know, you're never gonna get out of the system. But now, the system has actually worked for me, now that I'm in the shelter, mm -hmm. and I'm in connection, and I'm in contact, and I'm actually working and helping the shelter as well. I think it's a, a common situation um, for children to end up in shelters, um, often without their mothers. But, you know, for mothers and children to end up in shelters, and like Pulalani, the, most of them try and escape abuse, and there aren't many options available to them. Um, and the sad thing is, is that this is a civil society concern 
and they're the ones that do something about it. Again, it's not our government coming in going, these are issues in our society. It's NPOs that are reaching out and trying to solve these societal problems. So I, I just find it absolutely amazing, you know, because Bilalani is one of these stories that I just love telling because he's the one that beat the odds. He never fell prey to alcohol, he never fell prey to drugs. Bilalani, you, you surfaced. And, and you are still working on it, you're still living in the shelter, but you are every day working towards the next little step. Um, what you guys don't know is that Bulalani then created his own little business. And I would like you to share that with us because it's so much hope. Uh, um, Felicity, I think this is the part where um, our audience can really enjoy this story because you know, you, go, you come from all of this abuse and you come from a township and you come from living on the streets and now living in a shelter. And you know, when I met Bulalani, he, he had the one thing that attracted me to him is his smile. And he's still just always, you see Bulalani, he smiles. He smiles with his whole face. And his story is just so fascinating because what he did, he started his own t-shirt business. So this t-shirt that he's wearing um, has a beautiful design on it. And it says Donkey Kazi. And Donkey Kazi, um, I'm going to ask you to explain a bit more about it, but he had this lady that helped him to start this little business, and he's now selling these T-shirts, and that is his little business that he created, and we are definitely trying to help him get this T-shirt into all the shops, not just in South Africa, but across the globe. So if you are watching and you have a shop and you are able to help him get this out there, please do contact us and let the word spread. So Bulalani, this whole T-shirt business, tell us how it came about. Um, it, uh, I started my t-shirt business called Danke Kasi during the period where I was unemployed and I needed to make some income for myself. So I started out Danke Kasi. Danke Kasi is basically just saying thank you to the people that have had a positive impact in my life, uh, making sure that I, my, my day is well spent and allowing other people to say thank you because I believe that everybody has someone to thank in their life. So. That's what the Kikasi came about. And I came up with a different design as well as um, the colors. So the green is means humbling yourself or maybe just humble beginnings where everything starts. And red, it means that it doesn't matter where you come from. The blood, our blood is all red. And so the blue is the sky's the limit. Um, we all face with challenges in our lives and we all have to, to go through, uh, to endure uh, amount, a massive amount of challenges. But that doesn't mean that, you know, there's not a brighter side out there. The sky's the limit. It's beautiful. I mean, yes. Felicity, this is Pandora's box, true hope, right? <laughs> we always speak about the hope at the bottom of Pandora's box. And, and this is it. This is the most beautiful story because there's always hope. There's, if, if Bulilani can do this, you know, having grown up on the streets since the age of nine, and you wonder if you could possibly get out of your situation, if you wonder if you could possibly do it, there's the hope. There's the proof in the pudding. He's done it. So can you. Bulilani, a beautiful story. We want to see more of you. We want to hear more of you. We want to see... Bulalani out there in the world. And I'm sure our audience members would like to see that um, and, and see your t-shirts all over in pep stores and in Ackermans and all the wonderful stuff, maybe even Woolies, eh? <laughs> <laughs> so I hope and I wish that everything goes well for you on your journey and that you go from strength to strength and that we will hear lots more about you in the future. Thank you. Thank you. I truly appreciate your time. And, um, yeah, from my part, I just want to go, you're such an inspiration to me um, and to people out there. And I really would like to also bring in a different aspect into your gratitude and being able to encourage other children who are growing up without dads to be as positive and have the self-esteem that you have, because that's one of the way the children get affected mm. is their self-esteem and their self-worth. And um, you've healed, and it's a wonderful way to, to help other children because they're our future. We Absolutely. have to change this from the anger to this gratitude and appreciation of being alive and the wonderful opportunities that that brings. 
Viewers, if you want to see lots more, if you want us to bring Pandora to your community, do email us on talkingtopandora at gmail.com. We are closing off this season next week, so do stay tuned right here on Pandora's Box Chat Show for lots more. We will tell you how we're going to proceed with season two. We're going to bring you opinion pieces, we're going to bring you problems, and then we are going to bring you solutions to your nearest community center. Please do stay tuned, subscribe and like and comment if you haven't done so yet. Remember, we have a competition every week. This week, we're going to do it a little bit different, so do stay tuned for lots more right after this. Today's show is a little bit different, where we are going to look at not a Pandora story that we normally cover, but we're going to ask our audience to be our Pandoras today and ask them to explain to us what are the, the struggles and the problems that they encounter in an impoverished area such as Delft. Baie kinders gaan bij aan uit die plek uit school. Nou daar wat hulle school gaan, daar word hulle gebully en geabuse van die ander school, van die plekse kinders. Hier is honderde kinders wat in die area wat ek ken, wat by die huise sit, en as hulle by die huise, daar gebruik hulle drugs, of hulle, soos die kinders wat klip gooi, en die kinders wat mekaar stiek moet nie meste, omdat daar nie een school in ons area is, ons het daar by die kelms hulle gaan aansoek doen, om te vraag vir die school, ons het daar vir denplate ook al, die tijd gevraag, en hulle die post al school maak, en einde hoewe nie, om rede dat die kinders nie so uit die school uit is, maar het nog niks gedoen aan die situasie nie. My sien is 21 nou, hy is uit die school, hy het weensomstandighede, hy het omgestaan met die mes, hy word geroep, as hy van die school afkom, en toe het hy die school gelos, hy sit nou by die huis, want hy het hier werkie, en hy kan die school gaan nie, want hy word geabuse, en die middels moet ons die kinders gaan haal, waar wat hy school gaan, moet ons hy gaan haal, dan sê daar wat ons gaan, moet ons saam met hulle gaan sit in die klas om examen te skryf. Dit is allemaal abusive en bully, maar niks moet gedoen aan die situasie nie. In eindhoven nie. Ons het al, ek het gepraat van een petition, moet ons opsteel dat hulle vir ons kan help met een hoogschool, maar dit kom nie so ver he. En het word nou al dat die meisie kinders begin doen nou al uit die school uit te gaan, en as jy wees nie as die meisie kan swanger, maar om die omstandighede, hy kan nie by die school uitkom nie, hy is baie kinders wat soos vir school gaan, maar ons wil nie daar gaan, ons wil nie daar gaan, nie so ver, die jongens gaan ons vanmiddag in warm met, en dat kan met die mes en amal die. Nou, dit is net, my opinie is net vir mag, mevrouw, ek moet nie deel om vir ons, as hulle kan vir ons help om een school te bouw, een hoogschool, dat ons een kinders kan, uit die omstandighede kan uitkom, dat hulle kan in die schools, en as hy aan die eindhoven loop, wie so, dan sien sy, ek werk 15 jaar by eindhoven laar school, maar as die kind uitgaan graad 7 by eindhovense school, dan gaan net 6 maanden by die hoogschool, en na die 6 maanden, dan is hy by die huis, want dan word hy gebully, Nou vraag jy, hoekom gaat jy nie meer school nie? Nee, ek kan nie by voorbereid gaan nie, want die jongens dag my in. Ek kan nie by hindel gaan nie, die jongens dag my in. Ek kan nie, daar is baie van die ouwers, wat die vir oog in teksie vee het, om sy kind na school toe te stuur in die eelsies of in die... Nou, as die kind by die huis, as jy, as jy dier die area loop, as meer jong kinders, wat op hoepie sit, 
wat die school gaan nie. Ek het een netboorteam vir my opgemaak, ek is nou al sêke 15, 20 jaar met die netboor, die meisies, wat ek met netboor speel. Ek het daar gevla, vraag vir oos vir, vir my, vir my te help, vir, um, vir hulle van netboor kleren, wat ek ondersteun, die man ondersteun vir oos daarmee nie, maar oos gaan my net aan, en al wat ek net vir, as jy vir ons kan net, al net vir ons as school kan bou, en ek kom meen dat die jong kinders wil aan sports deel neem, maar hy is man, uh, um, is men, uh, uh, hoe kan ek sê, activiteite in Eindhoven, dat die kinders die kan deel nie man spoort sê. Ek bleef al die meeste van my leven hier in die deels. Um, en die grootste probleme in ons gebied is werkloosheid tussen die jong mense, wat dan leid na crime en drugs toe. Daar is niks vir die jong mense hier in die deels, waarmee hulle vir hulle self bezig men kan hou nie. As het die school is wat hulle verlaat het, dan is het hulle huise. As het die huise is, dan is het die gemeenskap wat hulle verlaat. Omdat wat jy wil hulle nodig het, om hulle self op die been te kry, is nie in die gemeenskap. He. Die gemeenskap leiders kan nie vir hulle help, he, omdat die gemeenskap leiders is te ver van die deeg van die half af, om te verstaan wat hulle strykelblokke is. Um, en mis dat vooral in die deelf, as die um, dynamiek wat voorbij is. Ek dink die stats moet syke na uit is, 22 moorde in een week. Um, Daar is waar men ons in die deelf moet elke dag vast aankyk. You know, um, as reality. Statistics op die level effect. Amal het effect Elke uur, elke minuut van jou dag, as jy winkel toe gaan, het effect jou, as jy school toe gaan, het effect jy kinders. Die dames en die groot maas wat nie weet, het die kruim effect vir hulle ook, het effect hulle klein kinders wat hulle moet groot maak, en het effect die hele community. Ose leiers effect het die meeste, omdat hulle kom nie na die pleit toe nie, Die gemeenskap is nou al by die punt waar hulle die recht in hulle eie handen vat of die recht in hulle eie initiatiefs. Hulle help hulle self, wat nog steeds daar is nie die help so dat hulle redig op die been kan kom. He. Klein initiatiefs word begin, wat omdat hulle nie gejaap word nie, erens langs die pad steer wat het uit. Ek het as sê nie, hy is 28, hy is op traks en hy was so 10 jaar onder die hospital en ek het so gesikkel met hom, Hy het al die hele huisgesin met die mes gesteek. Ek het voor ons in die Koran gesit. Ek het oorals gegaan wat die help is. Ek het in die kaap gegaan, ek het op sabbatrie. Ek het by die review boot gegaan en lente gegaan. Ek het niks die help gekry nie. En... En nou sê jy die oomblik in die eerste rafie. En dan gaan hulle om vir ses maanden weer terug die stikkeling toe. En weet jy hoe ek voel, ek voel, ek voel my so abuus. En sy moet nie vir my gejaag he. Ek het so in die vrees geliefde met my vrou van die man was die help daar vir my. Die community was die daar vir my nie. Ek het alleen my dinge uitgesoot, en nou na my kind wees sê groot het, het ek gevra vir die community, wat na ons pleit, ja, ek het niks jaar op gekind, ek het maar so al nie, elke dag, dan moet ek maar die kind, a twee jaar aan gee, of geel gee, as ek het, om nou net vir hom, hoe sê mys gerust te stel, anders te gaan, en aan in die huis, hy het my julle gesin gesteek, ons was op die hof gewees, die hof het gesê, hulle kan nie vir my jaar op die, want hulle gaan sê nou plek in die gevangenis hier, Maar na twee jaar sal hulle een kooi kry vir hom, en niks het gebeur nie. Ek het weer teruggegaan na die social workers, al het vir my vorms laat invul. Ek het een met die wat gemaakt by Bjelwolof. Ons het het ingevat, niks het nog nooit die gebeur nie. En na die kind nou weer in is na stikland, eerst ervee het ek nog niks aan hoort gekry nie. En ek het na die polistatie gegaan en hulle het vir my kom help om die kind daar te kry in die hospitaal. So ek voel, soos ek is 66, Ek voel, daar moet die help wees, die community moet saamstaan, maar in so'n geval, en as jy heel alleen, niemand help jou nie. 
en ik vaart en is een bijgevaarlijke kind. En ik, ik wil zo graag voor die staat gevraagd dat ik hij vampieren kan hulle voor me maak als een staat passeren wat hulle misschien voor mijn weekend zal die en niet heel wat hij is toen niet. Want niet meer voor ons ik nou wie voel nie, ik is gelukkig en zo, maar niemand voel hoe jij voelt niet. Nou als misschien nou is als amper soos ik als nou weer een vries, dan kom ik in huis toe. Wat gaan nou weer gebeur? Hoe moet ik nou voor me nou weer aan tier? Want ik aan tier moet nou reeds voor tien jaar in de spijen lang. En hoe ga ik nou maken weer met die kinders die kinders huis toe kom? Dat is wat hoe ik voel. En dan is het die kinder al zeer, zeer prom. Maar hij is een gevaar voor ons in die huis. Zien mevrouw? Nou, ik weet niet. Dat is niet wat dat mij bij staan. <coughs> Als dus ik en hij, en mijn ander zien wat week, en met twee kleinkinders waar aan die is, is het al wat aan die is. Maar ik zou zo wel eens komen eens uit, om te komen kijken, je conditie niet. Ik was, zoals ik mijn vrouw zei, lentig hier, observatory in die kaap, bij die wielboot, een scrollplikken, wat ik heel gevraagd om te gaan, maar ik heb niks help gekregen. Soms heb ik het gevoel, zoals mijn vrouw gezien het aan pakjes, dan heb ik zo gevoel, dan zit ik die touw daar neer. En dan denk ik van, dan ga ik die touw om die kind sit, of ik vat zo mijn pullen wat aan die huis is, dan maak ik het bij elkaar om het voor te geven, om hem af te keren. Zie, ik heb het op dat stadium, maar kom ik het voor de politie ook gezegd, ik voel in dat stadium om die kind dood te maken, dan moet hulle maar van mij komen halen. Net om een rustigheid in die huis te krijgen, want dat is hier rustigheid. Nie. En zo so hij nou daar in die hospitaal is, ik ga wat het om, maar ik heb nog altijd die vrees in mij, als hij nou terugkomt, wat gaat nou weer gebeuren met ons? Ik heb voor kort liggen gevraagd voor een keer aan ze leid. Ik heb gezegd dat ik die kleine kaart breng. Ik heb gegaan daar, was hij daar niet, zijn werker was daar. Ik heb gezegd, ik heb gezegd, ik kaart breng. Maar niks is gebeurd. Ik heb al bij je bij die deze kantoren gegaan. Ik weet waar niet kapen. Ik heb oor, zoals ik maar vroeg, oorals ze gaan maar als. Niks wat van mij komt terug, return. Maar ik kan zo so en zo so maken. Ik is een oma, enkel oma, met vier vosterkennis. Ik kan vanmiddag met allemaal saam praten. Ik heb mijn vier kinders groot gemaakt. Ons het in 1994 kom intrek. Mijn vier kinders het bij voorbrug hoor gematriculeer. Met mijn klein kinders moet hoor school toe gaan. Toe is het een absolute ramp. Mijn oudste klein kind is 22. Maar om van hom te praten of van hom te denken, breng niet tranen. Ik heb dan probeer groot te maken, zoals enige aan een goede moeder, opgevoed in huis van een jaar. Maar drugs het me kind verwoest. Ik wil van mijn recht vragen dat ouders alsjeblieft moet acht nemen van die probleem. Van die grootste evil waarmee ons in deelt zit, is drugs. En dan is dat toch nog van ons ouders, wat het niet wil erkennen. Mijn tweede kleinkind is ook waarschuwd toe. In graad 9, van februari tot oktober, was hij gebully. Ik heb de een brief naar de andere brief van die waarschuwd gekregen. Een vergadering naar die ander bijgewoon. Ik heb op een woensdag middag een hele middag in die reen gestaan om in schoolhoofd te woord te staan. Van mijn hart het uitgegaan van mijn kind. Wat ik zei, het ik bewijs voor. Mijn kleinkind heeft opgeëindigd vroeg in december. In die hof. Want ik gebreek aan die einde november. En wat toen daar gebeurt, is toen om mijn laatste keer bully, te gooi zijn vriend voor mijn mes. Zijn vriend zei het was een sigaret, maar het was definitief een mes. Maar ik kan kon iemand vermoorden als een voor van bully. Ik is niet trots daarop, ik is stukken. Want dit is nu ook mijn kinder, klein kinder, groot gemaakt. Ik zit nu met een geval met mijn kleindochter. 
my derde klein kind. Die eindste boelies, wat haar broerkie geboelie het, is al van die jenne arimante bezig met haar. Ek is nou alweer school uit en in, maatskappelike werkster uit en in, departement van onderwijs uit en in. Die boelies bly sit op die school, daar word absoluut niks aan hulle gedoen nie. En die goeie kinders, wat wil leer, hulle word sê gemaakt. Ek sê nie my klein kinders is engelkies nie, want hulle ma was nie een engelie, en ek is ook nie een engelie, maar ek pluit vanmiddag by Delftse ouwers. Asseblief ouwers, laat ons hande vat, laat ons bid vir ons kinders, laat ons praat met ons kinders. Boelie leid tot moord. En as dikwils die onskuldige kind, of die kind wat uit die goeie huis kom, wat moet die prijs betaal. En as iets in jou huis gebeur, dit skut jou hele fondament. Jou leven sal nooit weer die selde wees nie, want ek is ook dwars oor die sestig, en my leven sal nooit meer die selde wees nie. Ek probeer vanmiddag my trane inhou, maar as daar een tye, wat ek net moet kyk na my klein kinders, dan loop die trane. Daar is soggens, dat ek my kind moet school toe neem, net om te kyk. Daar is tye in die middag, wat ek moet op die straathoek staan, net om te kyk of sy kom. Omdat die boelies is nie tevrede, dat hulle nie haar broerkie kon vernietig het nie. En waar dit begin? In die klaskamer. Die boelies wou hy het die broerkie moes deelwees van hulle gang. En toe hy weier, toe word die geboelie tien maande aan mekaar. Vanmiddag is my uitroep ook vir die kinders dat so klip gooi. Die kinders besef nie, hulle kan mekaar doodgooi nie is nie mooi nie, om mekaar uit te roei nie, want die kinders wat mekaar met die klippe gooi, is dikwils die kinders wat saam opgegroei het. Die groter jongens is nou bykie rustig, en nou begin ons kleinkies. Van die ouderdom van 8, 19 begin hulle nou klippe om te deel, hulle gooi mekaar wat al reeds weer geleid het, tot oor en weer my steker is. Ouwers, my uitroep is aan u. Laat ons as moeders, moeders, laat ons begin saam bid. Laat ons hande vat. Moe nie, laat ons mekaar kruisig nie. Laat ons die probleem invat. Ek het nie aan die taal vanmiddag as om te vraag, selfs hier in Eindhoven, kan die government nie een plek opsit, waar ons kan by mekaar kom, en sylke type dinge doen nie, soos gebedsoogende, gebedsaande, bidere en so meer. Al die verskillende kerke kan saamkom en bid, want ons het nie in sy bijeenkomst plek nie. Alles wat ons wil doen, moet ons in die laarskoolse saalkie hou. Daarvoor moet ons betaald somtijds, of dis te donker, of dis te ver, of die klippereen, of die ganne fluit. Ons het nie ergens om te gaan nie, ons het niks om te doen nie, ons kan nie eens meer saam bid nie. Hoe gaan ons ons straat beveilig, as ons nie saam bid nie? Hoe gaan ons ons kinders beveilig, as ons nie mekaar sy hande vat nie? Ons kan nie meer beklein nie, die tyd is te kort. En ek is jammer vir elke ma, wat miskien vanmiddag in hierdie situasie sit, dis loutere heel. Ek is maar die oma, my dochter is 12 jaar oorlede, maar ek dink nie, dit waar die my kleinkinders gaan, is dat sy so vol vakkenis gehad het. 
En dat is absoluut niks wat ik kan doen nie. Ik het ook al soos een mouw, wonder op en af gehaard loop, van die departement naar die departement, van die uh, mens naar die mens, van die adres naar die adres, maar ik het ook niet altijd die fondse om bij allemaal uit te komen. Of ik hard loop van die plek naar die plek, dan kom ik daar, dan krijg ik net een telefoonnummer, dan het ik een geelke, dan koop ik e dan wordt het gezegd, hou aan, hou aan, ik schakel je deur, ik schakel je deur. En zo kom ik nooit bij de rechte persoon uit, nie. Toe ik geloof in mijn recht erens, moet dat iemand wees wat kan voorzien. Met ons kinders en ons kleinkinders wat op drugs is. Ons kinders en ons kleinkinders wat met elkaar bekleed. Ons kinders en ons kleinkinders wat hier rond hard loop, zonder school. Maar ik zal rechtig van mij graag wel zien dat Eindhoven moet wees zoals de jaren tot ons komen en trekken. Eens was ons een gelukkige groep mensen, maar dan heeft het in de afgelopen jaren bij je verslag. En ongelukkig is het zo, so, vooral waar ik gegaan het verhaal, het bij je sommige van mij recht gezegd: ik klaag niet. Ik klaag onnodig. Ik klaar alleen. Niemand het nog komt klaar niet. Dat is het type antwoorden wat ik al gekregen. Nu hanteer ik als enkel oma zulke dingen. Want als ik kind niet kan, zijn frustratie, dan buiten uit lief niet, dan komt hij huis toe. Hij komt uit binnen uit hem. Hij steelt je goed, hij breekt je goed, hij zoekt bekleid, want hij is gefrustreerd. So, my enter was my net for help. Well, there you have it, straight from the community. These women are leaders in their own right. And in order to help them to help themselves, we need to find solutions to these problems. I will net for you all, very, very thank you say that you with us, your stories have been shared today. I feel your pain. I can never for myself imagine what it must be to be in such a community. To be in. I can net say that my heart goes out and we will try from our side om vir julle te help um, en julle stories daar uit te kry so dat die mense kan hoor waarmee julle sikkel en wat julle probleme is. En dit is al wat ek vir julle kan beloof op hierdie stadium. Um, ons het gewoonlik een competitie wat ons elke week doen en ons gee een geskenkie vir, vir die mense wat ons program kyk. En vandag wil ek vir julle een geskenkie gee en ek dink, oma met al klein sien Hassan verdien hierdie geskenkie en dit is um, sy naam is a worry buddy en hy um, het een verskrikkelijke interessante story en oma aan hierdie kant het vir ons vertel van al die bullies en die mens, van die kinders wat so gebully word so dit is a worry buddy wat die kinders saam um, mee kan gesels en al hulle probleempies op een papierkie skryf en as hulle dan die papierkie hier insit dan eet die worry buddy al hulle probleempies op en dan kan hulle dit weer toemaak En dit is wat hulle gebruik, baie by die seelkundige ook, dat die kinders met hulle stories kan gesels, en dan kan mama gaan wees na die tyd, wat is die kindse probleem nou eindelijk. So ons wil vir jou, Hassankie, ons wil vir jou die worry buddy gee, so dat jy met hom kan gaan speel, hoor. En dan sit jy al jou probleempies daar in, en dan gaan die worry buddy alles opeet wat word jy worry, en dan maak jy hom toe, en dan gaan jou worries net so verdwijn. Ok. So I want to appeal to all of you out there, if you're running a community center, if you have access to funding, if you know how we can assist this community to build a school, to build a community center where they can activate some sports to keep the youth in, engaged and stay away from drugs, please contact us at talkingtopandora at gmail.com. We are looking for, for solutions and we would like to give hope to the community of Delft. Until next time, good night.